The worst horror movie I ever saw was fucking great. Hello and welcome to This May Hurt a Bit. My name is James Strayer and this is... John C. Myers. And we are a horror franchise podcast discussing each film in popular and not so popular franchises. And today we're discussing the wrap up of Basket Case. So three films... Started with uh, Frank Henenlotter, early 80s. Got pretty wacky, huh? Got got extremely wacky. I mean, you always say, I want a movie to get wacky with it in the in the sequel. Did this over wackify you or were you it, sufficiently whacked? Uh, <laughs> I was well, I was thoroughly <laughs> whacked. That's definitely <laughs> unquestioned. But yeah. it got I mean. As we talked about in the last episode, the fact that it sort of eases you into how goofy part three is, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mind as much, but yeah, it just, it, Frank Henlotter said he's not a horror director and yeah. he stuck to that. He's like, I'm not interested in doing that. I just want to have some goofy monsters running around and yeah, he did. Even though he did not want to make the third one, I still, you know, this was all a singular vision of yes. sorts. Yeah. And that's, that's what I kept thinking about when I was considering how I was thinking about these three films as a franchise where it's like, even if they don't always work for me, it's kind of like that, uh, that phantasm effect where it's just mm -hmm. like, I love this guy. I, I mean, I like the phantasm guys a little bit more, but I'm just like, they went into it with an idea. Yeah. They saw it through. They did exactly what they wanted to do. That's the curve I tend to grade on these days. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for wanting to make the movie that you want to make. And even though it's, it's not what I loved about the first one. I still have to respect that you that you didn't want to do the first one again. Mm -hmm. And so that's fine. You know, if you're not, you're like, yeah, I, I did that. I don't think it came out the way I wanted it to. Or, you know, clearly, as we talked about, like he and the uh, movies have shown, he's more interested in, in the, the, the silliness of it. Right. So taking it more that way. Like th that initial jolt is, is like, OK, but then you meet it on its level and it's still like they're not great movies, but they're fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I honestly think I liked them more this time around than I did when I initially watched them because mm -hmm. I was younger and I'm sure that I watched them in back to back succession when I was probably in my mid 20s or so. And right. I, I feel like I would not have had the the maturity to enjoy Basket Case 3. Yeah. But, <laughs> but what you're saying of just like meeting it on its level and just being like, you know, I, I respect the filmmaker for going where he wanted to go. And yeah. so knowing that going into these movies, I was a little bit more prepared for it. Not completely. I had kind of forgotten about the bus scene, that kind of stuff. So there were still some lows for me, but um, kind of knew what I was getting into a little bit, so it made it easier. Yeah, and this time around, like seeing, I've extolled the virtues of, of Annie Ross and being a little bit more familiar with that aging star appearing in these, you know, crummy horror movies. Mm -hmm. Be it for what we've done, like Mickey Rooney, Betsy Palmer, whatever. And so seeing another one of these these old time Hollywood stars do it, but still just like be so into it and Committed. this like big gusto performance was a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, if we if we go for our typical lead off of this conversation, which is which order do you think you would watch these in again? I don't know if I'll ever watch two and three again. I don't know why I would really, but mm -hmm. uh, part one, I will probably revisit again in the next five years because it's fantastic. I know the Hollywood theater in Portland played it not long ago and I mm -hmm. skipped it for some dumb reason. I think it was like to pass my bedtime or something <laughs> and I just didn't go. So Men of a certain age. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely one is one I've revisited several times and will continue to revisit. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit more like I have warmer feelings for two and three. And honestly, I might revisit three before two. Uh, I, I was kind of thinking the same I'm, thing. I'm, torn. No I'm not sure because like it is like, well, I just want something super dumb to put on. It mm -hmm. just has a real infectious energy and is, and is fun. And then when it gets the the big, you know, gory bits, it's it's pretty big and gory. Whereas two is a little bit more. Just guys in masks running around. Well, the Deaths in Two had the great uh, photography flash going off oh, in the, the photography up, flash. Yeah, that upstairs. was upstairs. That was cool. But three is just so like off its rocker that you know it's like, well, this if, if I'm in the mood for this kind of thing, get the raw, un, uncut stuff. <laughs> hit basket case. It's three. pretty obvious how how the tone changed, and it's like mm -hmm. just more of a you know the first one you could call a horror movie. The second and third one is definitely comedy slash yeah. horror you know like lead with the comedy so like how do we think that the uh the lore changed or did it change i feel like it was fairly consistent it was i mean it was when it needed like, to be 
Yeah, they they made Belial much more of a standalone entity rather mm-hmm. than just uh, head and arms grafted onto this guy's body. Because like he can reproduce, he can, yeah. you know whatever. It's not like that stuff really deeply mattered to, to Frank Henenlotter. Sure, who, who allegedly I was just reading this. If you listen to our Twin Peaks episode, I recommended the the essay in the um, the Memories of Laura book by Willow McKay, and she just uh, wrote a thing about Basket Case and Frank Henenlotter, and and said that. Uh, Henelotter has some fake blood from the first basket case still in his fridge, I mean, uh, which I think is is pretty great. I love that. I love that. Clamato juice, fake blood, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, you uh, I'm, I got that spaghetti sauce out of your fridge. Wait, no. I guess this is a movie that doesn't require a lot of lore. And we yeah. only have three movies to arc over this. So it, it's, I think the only lore, and I'm using that term, I guess, fairly loosely, but it's just like, is it, it's just the kind of like a uh, psychological, like pairing of the two. Right. And it's the, he gets torn off, he gets reattached, he gets torn off again. Mm-hmm. That's kind of it. And then we learn about more unique individuals later on. So that is a way of expanding the universe. That is a way of how far are we from Baghead? Mm-hmm. real far real far yeah like it's <laughs> still damn the far. same two guys but like what their whole deal is is way different mm-hmm. we're meant to be together and these guys tore us apart so it's a mission of vengeance in the first one and then you know Dwayne wants out and then, then the other ones they're just they're comedic foils for this other stuff so it's just real it's just sort of riffing on that relationship in the first one I mean I I really think that in a lot of ways especially tonally like I don't know if we've had especially in a one to two to three series, I don't think we've had something that's gotten this far away from Baghead in the rest of the series that we've done. Like the total tonal shift is yeah. so far away from the f- from part one. Well, and you you think about the length of time too, because so the first one it was made, yeah, early early eighties, and then you know it took years for him to pick up. Mm-hmm. And, and do it again but then it was just boom boom right after that yeah the other movies we've done again going back to Friday the 13th how those have changed over a 20 year period sure and that that's that can affect things whatever but this was so quickly just like I don't want to do this anymore yeah. so uh, here's a bunch of I'm not interested I'm not the same guy I was 10 years ago with that so these two are going to be a lot a lot sillier mm-hmm. and so yeah tonally it gets really really far away from it but it's all the same guy mm-hmm. um, which I mean you could argue that that to, to you know to an extent we might have I'd have to listen to the episode but uh the the phantasm is a bit like that like yeah. at its core it's all the same stuff but it got the the lore and all that stuff got got a lot sillier and kind of but it was never very concrete to begin with well and especially because what part 2 was done in 90 and part 3 was done in 1991 so it was just so mm-hmm. on the heels of each other that they didn't have a lot of time to marinate on something new. Right. Basically like, you know, Belial doesn't go to space as the cliche would involve right. and you know, that kind of thing. And the more of these I watch, the more I'm like, just send them to space. Yeah. <laughs> just send them to space. Why not? Just that would, that would, that would be from Pumpkinhead. Why wouldn't Pumpkinhead be in space? That might be fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, We'll get to Hellraiser and Leprechaun. They both right. go to space. Yeah. I could rest easy knowing that they will go to space. <laughs> right. Um, do we have a favorite supporting character? I was oh, looking man. for, you know, because we don't have a, we don't have a favorite final girl for these. It's not right. that kind of movie. We don't really even have any favorite recurring characters ex- except for maybe like Granny Ruth. Yeah. But she's like a main character. So it's kind yeah. of hard to like, Yeah. It's like she's she's like just right up there with with Belial and, and Dwayne. Sure. I don't know. The the introduction in part three of Clarence and his lettuce. Sure. The, the monsters, they're unique individuals that just there is no explaining mm-hmm. what is going on with them. And they just, like his Clarence. There's like his spine yeah. is coming out of his head. He's got this huge under like it's just they went nuts with it and went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a guy. And so I kind of like that, but it's hard to pick out. I can pick out some in, unique individuals that are kind of, yeah, I don't really like that much, but as far as like ones, when I like sure. them, I like them, yeah. you know, like I, uh, there's not specific ones out you of that. You don't want to play favorites to your unique in- individuals because they're all unique. Yeah. yeah. They're all, they're all unique. They're all precious little snowflakes. Um, but the pinheaded guy right. got tired of it. Cause it's really just about mm-hmm. them at, at a certain point. Cause everyone else dies. Yeah. I mean, I guess one of my favorite kind of side characters, he's not really even really supporting. And I mean, he gets killed, but man, I loved the 
the carnival barker guy, the smackaroos guy. Oh, he was great. And then as far as like pieces of shit go, which two has a lot more mm-hmm. just like awful pieces of shit. We called him out in the episode, but the guy that's like, where are you going, baby? Oh, when are you yes. going to make me dinner? Yeah, yeah, hey, I love yeah. you. No, I hate you. Mm-hmm. I know, that guy rules. Um, not real. Not a good one to meet in real life. But <laughs> sure. I enjoyed watching that much with yeah. the smackaroos guy. But yeah, smack. Mm-hmm. I forgot about smackaroos guy. That guy. I want to be that excited about anything. Acromegala, acromegala. Mm-hmm. But yeah. then, yeah, just how he he goes into performance mode immediately when he's showing her around mm-hmm. to an audience yeah. that's not there. And I was like, that's that's a step above. Does it change out of his right. dirty union suit? Just, you know, he's like, he knows mm-hmm. that he's got the goods. Do we have a favorite kill? And this is going to be hard because some of Belial's kills are not that cool. Just going to say it because yeah. it's... The budget that they're working with, it's just the classic, as we always say, uh, Academy Award winning performance where an actor is holding a prosthetic onto their face and flopping around, acting like they're getting ravaged. You know, Belial, I love Belial, but he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of mobility. He doesn't. He just slashes that kind of stuff. He pops, he I pops mean, out of a basket. And that's fun. That's kinda, Don't get me wrong, but it's a little repetitive. Yeah. When the first one they did, he did a lot more like mm-hmm. with the bisecting and, and all that. And he, he really um, goes to town on. So it, like when he's like really just goes nuts on Dr. Cutter and her face could stab with scalpels. That one's good. Like it's, it's all the second one is, is really more of the set pieces mm-hmm. around the kills. Like I like that the, the constant flashing of the camera or yep. the setup for the private detective where it's revealed that everyone there is, but then the deaths themselves aren't really necessarily that, that fantastic. Um, I mean, other than when they try to turn her into a, a freak or something. Oh, but, I did like that. Yeah. Yeah. But in the, in the third one, like the whole police station mayhem is just sure. great. The, the goofy, the goofy choking effect. And then when the guy accidentally, or when they shoot the daughter and she accidentally sits on one mm-hmm. of the gross little Bilal guys. Great. Loved all and, that. And, you know, um, police, that was fun. Police uh, station massacres are a staple in certain types of horror films. Yeah. In good, in good movies. movies. Yeah. And w- Wish exactly. Master, Terminator. Yep. Citizen all Kane. Those. Yeah, yeah. All of those. I don't like, I'm looking for one in my head. It's, it might be the attic in part two. This is kind of just adjacent, like kill scene adjacent because I, I wish they would have injected a kill into this, but I think my favorite bit in all these three movies is to stop motion in part one. Yeah. Yeah. Mainly because I just love stop motion animation. I love it when it's done cheaply and you can see how they just you can see how painstaking it was. That's yeah. why I love it. Well, it's just it's also just so uncanny. The, just the feeling of the first one. It's so strange. It, we, it oddly it fits in this whole thing. It makes it makes yeah. Bile more and monstrous. I, like the shrieking and how the audio sounded in that bit. The only thing that could have made that sequence better is a kill at the end, like a hotel person just mm-hmm. walking in and be like, what's all that noise? And just like rap, you know? Right. So that, I know that doesn't count as a kill, but that's just my favorite scene uh, of a bit yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, these movies aren't really about the kills. And I kind of right. wish they were, but I also know that you're dealing with just a blob with one arm. So mm-hmm. you made your basket, you lie in it. Right. So <laughs> <Right>. you just, <laughs> that's, that's what you got to work with. It's not, the first one is slightly more of a slasher, although not really, because I mean, it's, it's a, it doesn't really follow those, those same kind of rules, but yeah, it really kind of gets away from that. So it's not really going to have the same, the kills were not really necessarily the focus, but when, you know, it's, it's less the let's do a super amazing kill versus let's put Belial in a cool suit. I mean, a cool mecha suit. I've been thinking about that mecha suit since we watched that movie. Mm-hmm. It had the exact desired effect on me. And I was like, man, that was cool. And again, yeah. I know I mentioned it in the previous one, but the moment the little shield comes down like that, that was like a punchline to the joke of the mecha suit. I loved it for men of, or for people of our age. When you replace Krang as my go to thinking mm-hmm. about that kind of thing, that's mm-hmm. quite an achievement like that's And it's it's not just a recency bias. It's more just like that's. I like the home my, where yeah. I'm at in my life now. I like that. I like that someone made that. It's a very defined uh, ramshackle thing that someone made versus some uh, you know weird bald guy. Yeah, that exactly. Just nestles into and I, li- I like realness in my blobs in mech suits. I, I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's got a little. It's got a little aliens power loader. 
for me for that. Right. So I can't, I can't help but love that. But um, just as the flash entering the speed force made you stand up and pump your fist, according to the Academy Awards a few years ago, Mm -hmm. that was the stand up and cheer moment for me of the basket case films. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that would be so great if that's what won is basket case three. It's crazy right in. It wasn't even nominated. If only we had the power of the Snyder kids. Yeah. Oh, man. I would use it for good, but not ill. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, I will say though, on further reflection, like why didn't, why not just give him tank treads? Why oh, give him sure. Walking legs. Right. Maybe not as like, you can't go back and forth. You can only go forward and backwards. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, you know, it's easy for us now in the future with segway <laughs> technology to just assume that's, you know, they didn't have that back then. Or even uh, Johnny Five. Johnny Belial, man, we are dating ourselves right now. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't even name the movie, yeah, but we are with, with all <laughs> good stuff, <It's laughs> all better good stuff, stuff, actually. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. That, yeah. You kids today <laughs> right. with your chappies, you don't know, you don't know what you're missing. If we go basket case four, is it a reimagining? Is it a is it a legacy sequel after part one? Is it moving on Mm -hmm. where he's reflecting on his mech suit and all of his friends he left behind in the in the barnyard? (laughs) It's like it's like the end of the Hulk TV show where he's just coming (laughs) a ride with that music playing the the mech suit. Yeah, the same sad music. Just (laughs) man, I love sad walking away Hulk music. Um, That's what I think of whenever I walk outside of my house. (laughs) (laughs) That's so sad. You're like, gotta go to the store. Um, Well, if I was going to the store in a mech suit with Belial in my belly, I think I'd be enjoying things a little bit more. Yeah. But um, obviously, as much as movies try to do these days, you cannot remake the feel of 1981 Times Square in New York on a $35,000 budget. You just, you can't, it's untouchable. So... I think you go legacy sequel and pick up, even though, again, as we've said, there's no reason for there to be a sequel because yeah. they die. You, you, you'd only you'd probably only be able to capture like a really sort of like heightened um, art directed mm-hmm. version of it, I think. Um, you know, because I think like the I want to take the closest thing to this kind of feeling. It's not very is the Joker. Mm-hmm. movie. You know what I mean? Like it's that kind of aesthetic. He did it pretty well. Todd Phillips Which still doesn't really he did it pretty well. Yeah, but it's, it's still not it's shot the same on a back thing. lot and you can tell. I mean, it's really because it's really trying to be maniac yeah. in a lot of ways. And um, even that had like more production value than this. So, yeah, if you were going to do it again, I would like either just like do just a straight up retelling of it or yeah, legacy sequel because you you it's either you lean into it and you go like, all right, we're, we're getting we're going to stay as silly. Which would be, I think, a harder sell because, I mean, just talking about the marketing aspect of it is no fun. But like, you know, more people are familiar with Basket Case than with mm-hmm. the later ones. So if you want to try to capture that ridiculous tone, that might be, you know, people might be like, what the hell is this? I would I, I would absolutely yeah. admire if you pull it off well. In a way, uh, uh, Alice Winters freaked. Yes. Kind of did. Mm-hmm. People in big goofy masks. I think if, if it gets done, my guess is it, they would completely skip yeah. over two and three and just either try to make it just as dark and gritty. Because that's a, that's a huge thing. And I think we touched on it in part three. But like if we're going the sheer numbers and screen time. The tone of these movies are two and three. Yeah. Not the one that we hold beloved or beliled. And, you know, it's just like the legacy is the goofy, but more people know the first one. Which, yeah, that's that's interesting. It's like in the first one, you know, as we talked about, like there's a lot of like thematic stuff there to, 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 that you can dig into in, in terms of like identity and, and gender. If you want to go down that route or or just the sort of psychological stuff where the second and third one are really just just straight up much more like silly and fun. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they're more you're more likely to get someone to try to redo that aspect of it than to just be right. crazy uh, makeup stuff. I mean, and also like just to dip our toes into this, but like, how do you even approach the ending of part two and just the gonzo sexual ridiculousness that the yeah. Hen and Lauder brings to it? I, I don't like to be that guy that says you can't make that movie now. I just don't know how you would go about that. I, I completely agree with you in a lot of ways when you said it in the part two episode of like Frank Henneloter wanted to start with that scene and work backwards to get there. Like he loved that. Right. I'm not saying I didn't love it. Like it's ridiculous, but right. I don't know if you can have that level of a uh, horny Belial running around. Yeah. Right well, now. It's just like you, you'd either have to like, I mean, yeah, movies in general are fairly sexless these days, but like, I feel like you'd either have to like push it to this ex- ridiculous extreme a la mm-hmm. like team America or be a lot more 
puritanical about it. Like not it, it's implied right. and you don't see it, you know, because it's it's also just like it'd be tough to improve on the most erotic scene <laughs> I've ever seen. You know, it's like, I don't know how you would how, how you would yeah. necessarily improve on and that. And I don't um, know how you can do Henenlotter in the spirit of Henenlotter again if you don't include that kind of stuff. Honestly, make a sequel, make Basket 4 animated. Oh. So then you can get as goofy and serious as, you know, it could it could be on one hand some ridiculous stuff and all of a sudden it's yeah. Bojack Horseman. Like Dwayne being like, you know, am I the real mistake yeah. or, you know, whatever. That's a good idea. Who do we pitch? Patent pending, patent pending, patent pending. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you're an animator, right? Let's just do this. Oh, yeah. yeah to yeah. that level. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Moving text around the screen. Exactly the same thing as hand drawn animation. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But I, I think, unfortunately, I think maybe the, the window for that kind of stuff is passed, yeah. but we'll bring it back. Kind of running out of steam on this already. I mean, yeah, there's... <sighs> There's not a lot to, when the, when the movies are sort of just as sort of on their face about mm-hmm. it. There's not a lot. And there's only three yeah. of them. You know, the big leap was between part one and part two, much the same way of like Friday the 13th. Like the biggest leap was between part one right. and part two is that like it just jumped to being like much sillier. Mm-hmm. And then it just sort of stayed that way for the, for the following. Right. One. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you're going to see any more of this. It's just kind of going to remain the, the curio that it was. We were talking off mic about. You know how they remade um, uh, William Lustig's Maniac mm-hmm. with Elijah Wood. So I mean, anything's Gosh, possible. Yeah, if you if you can get star power like Elijah Wood behind it, yeah. Like so, somebody out there like Timothy Chalamet must love Belial, and he wants to remake Basket Case. He would right. earn so much credit in my book. <laughs> if he's oh, totally. just like, yeah. come on, guys! But we're only doing it for a budget of fifty k, and just or yeah, like the hundred k passion yeah. project, yeah. <laughs> They just like the wispiest man is like, no, it's gotta, it's gotta be, be basket. Gotta be yeah. Belial. Which I mean, like, but then that's that's such a tough call too, because if you were to remake it, do you keep it as like do you keep Belial as crummy? Because you know, like I can't imagine a CG Belial. Like it just seems strange right. to me. Like or, or you know, uh, but makeup effects have gotten so much better. Amazing. I mean, even in the, even in this movie, uh, in this series, mm-hmm. the the stuff got exponentially better. But there is still part of me that likes that real crummy. Yes looking Belial that just adds to the whole right. thing. But I, I don't know how you would recapture that same magic. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it'd have to be its own thing. I'd see it, of course, but uh, I'm part oh, of the yeah. problem. So, well, let's uh, let's go and check the tapes and figure out who is closest in our kill count for the entire trilogy. So I looked it up before. It got wild in the, in the last one. Looked it up before. I said 21. You mm-hmm. said 25. Total? 21. 21. Oh, on the nose. Nice yes, work. So, I, yeah, the last one elevated it like by like 10 or so. I think it kind of yeah. went like 5, 6, 10, which makes sense for a, a series like this. But um, yeah. Well, and apparently like if you're kind of like tired of, of doing it, you're like, well, let's just mm-hmm. let's just make this as goofy as possible. Yeah. Let's just have fun with doing these fun. Totally. Kills. Yeah. So, I mean, 21 is not bad for a horror franchise of three movies. For I mean, that's an movies. average of seven. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of work. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 21 big deaths for Basket Case. So I'm still thinking about the like the, the sequel aspect of it, because Bilal still has 11 kids. And that's that's a lot of kids. I mean, OK, so if we're go- OK, how about that? Ooh, ooh. So the so it's it's years in the future, mm-hmm. right? They still they don't grow that big. They're still they're still small for for reasons because why not gremlin size? Yeah, and then like they have some more kits, and then it ends up being a suit of Belial's that Belial pilots. Ah, it, like that like that Clive Barker story about the two cities. I that love fight the, that story. The, oh, it's, yeah. it's so great. But yeah, something like that where it's just the, this this army of Belials that that forms together. If you did like a CG version of that, maybe that's the way that, that I, I could accept. So that. then he goes to space. He goes and, to space. Yeah, you know, if 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 he's piloting a ship of that, that gets pretty body horror. If they're all just kind of like a twisting oh, oh. around on each other, and it's like yeah. a living pulsating. He's flying a ship of his children put together. Right. I, I, I can Ooh, see that. Yeah. Cause he's got like a mind meld with them. Right. Too. Yeah. Cause oh. well, no, he couldn't have more kids cause Eve is dead, and, but, and, uh, but he, he replicates them. Sure. Somehow. And then Dwayne is the one who is sewn to the side of that ship. Oh, Ooh, how the tables have yeah. turned on Dwayne, yeah. oh. you know, and he's stuck. I think we just cracked and it. He doesn't yeah. know how to walk around. And now he's stuck to the side of the ship. Right. But he's, yeah, he's, and whatever, whatever machinations Belial does, like he's, 
he can't stop right. him. He's but he's stuck to the side, so he's in a, in a more powerless kind of thing and has to try to fight to get. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Screaming the entire time, but with select subtitles, you know, so we can uh-huh. finally hear what he's saying. <laughs> I like it. I'm that I'm works. Definitely okay, for that. we cracked the code. That's that's yeah. Send him to space. Hit all the hit all the buttons. Basket case four. Son of Belial. Sons of Belial. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Sons of Belial. Yeah. But with it with S U N S because he's in space. He's on there you planet. go. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, that's about all we've got to say on Basket Case. If that was your first time watch, what did you think of the dramatic tonal shift from part one to part two and then three? Um, were you as surprised as we were on our first time through? Did you like it? Did you enjoy the comedy aspect? Um, I feel like we got a little away from the whole horror stuff in this franchise so maybe we need to eventually get back to that but um Mm -hmm. until until then um as you were saying earlier uh patent pending um we are going to watch our next franchise is maniac cop uh we're gonna stay in the nasty new york 1980s um uh william lustig these are all available i think again on tubi really if you've got that service um there's a couple of nice blu-rays out of maniac cop uh this stars tom atkins and sort of robert zadar and it is it's it's a little less horror and more just kind of like i don't i don't know if this would qualify as grindhouse but it, it basically I mean, it's, is it's a, you know yeah but it's a, i mean it's ultimately a slasher mm-hmm. a slasher in the same way that perhaps that that uh, um friday the 13th your first friday the 13th right. was it's somewhat of a mystery mm-hmm. uh i suppose but yeah don't forget bruce campbell just gonna say bruce well. campbell as well so if you're evil dead fans who haven't branched out into a lot of bruce campbell's other acting work this is coming like or just branched out to moon trap and went no yeah. <laughs> right uh, if you if you want something around you know, the just after Evil Dead 2 kind of uh, realm of what Bruce Campbell is uh, capable Mm -hmm. of. This is fantastic. I think he actually gets to do a little bit more serious acting in this film. So, yeah, this was this was his first outside of working with Sam Raimi. Yeah, it's a big jump. But uh, yeah, check out Maniac Cop. Uh, There's only three of them. So this will be another shorter run like Mm -hmm. we've done. And then, you know, I've already started thinking about where we should go after like two trilogies of nasty New Mm -hmm. Yorkness. So um, we'll 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 get out of this area eventually. But I kind of like wallowing in uh, early 80s New York Times Square a little bit. Well, because we kind of we got a taste of it and then it went silly. So it's like, well, yeah, how about a little bit? Let's go back. So. All right, everyone. Uh, In the meantime, please leave us one of those big five star reviews wherever you get your podcast. And you can find us on this may hurt a bit pod on Instagram, heard a bit pod on YouTube. And you can email us at this may hurt a bit pod at Gmail dot com. So until then. Fire up some Maniac Cop, and we will see you next time. Good night. Good night. This has been a Caretaker Press production. It was produced by James Strayer and edited by John C. Myers. Logo by Ethan Kimberling and music by Michael Arthur Holloway, who you can find on Bandcamp. Follow us on Instagram at This May Hurt a Bit Pod and email us at This May Hurt a Bit Pod at gmail.com. Give us a five-star review over on your favorite podcast app, and we'll see you next time.